Good afternoon, everyone. I, I'm uh, Sean Eichmann. I'm the curator of Asian art at the Honolulu Museum of Art. I was going to say Academy, but I still have to stop doing that. Um, and I'll be your speaker today. Uh, before I start, I just want to make a few announcements. Um, this talk today, oh, by the way, happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Thank you for deciding to spend Valentine's Day here today. Um, uh, before I start, I want to make a few announcements. This lecture today is paired with a film in the theater this evening. The film is Taboo, or Gohato, by uh, the renowned uh, director Oshima Nagisa. And as many of you probably already know, uh, Oshima recently passed away. So it's a, a, an exceptional opportunity for us to have this chance to, to, to show one of his most famous films. Uh, the film is closely related to the topic of, of Shunga and what I'll be talking about today. And it actually uh, it tells the story of a, a, a wakashu during the, the 19th century. So I do hope that you'll uh, come back and see the film. As I understand it, uh, the theater is offering a, a, a discount on the price of the film to anyone who attends this afternoon's lecture. So that'll be a little added, added incentive for you. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that uh, there will be uh, a, another talk connected to our Shunga exhibition that will be on March 6th, which will be the emergence of early modern Japanese erotica by our Japanese art research associate, uh, Stephen Solel. Um, I'm a real amateur when it comes to Shunga, but Stephen's the expert, so I, I do hope that you'll come and, and, and hear him talk. Uh, my, my talk is really just a, a little preface to the in-depth analysis that, that he'll be able to provide you. Okay, uh, let's dive into the talk. Um, I always say start a talk with a joke. So uh, 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 yesterday, one of our partner institutions very kindly offered to help us promote this talk by sending out an email blast to, uh, to their mailing list. And they said that uh, they invited everyone to come to the Honolulu Museum of Art tomorrow to attend a sex-related event. So probably <laughs> some of you are expecting a particularly stimulating uh, presentation today. Uh, I did think about inviting everyone up onto the stage to take off your clothes and really have a, a party for Valentine's Day, but we probably should restrain ourselves from that. Um, I, 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 I do want to, to start with a disclaimer. Um, I, I am going to be talking about a, a number of very explicit images during this talk, and um, if I haven't at least offended everybody a little bit by the end of the talk, then I probably haven't done the artist justice. So uh, if, if that's not what you signed up for, then um, uh, please uh, feel free to, to leave the theater. Uh, when I told my own wife that I'd be giving a talk on Shunga and asked her if she wanted to come, she said, uh, yuck. So believe me, I won't be offended if, if, if that wasn't what you were expecting. Um, uh, for those of you who are up for the ride, though, let's, uh, let's dive right in. Uh, for my talk today, uh, as, as you already know, we're doing a series of three exhibitions on the topic of Shunga, and I'll, I'll tell you what Shunga is over the course of my talk. But uh, the, the, the current exhibition is up right now in the gallery right at the front of, of the museum and will be up through March 17th. So if you haven't had a chance to see it yet, I hope that you'll uh, take this opportunity and, and go up and take a look. Uh, also, we'll be doing a second exhibition on Shunga in the 19th century as part of the series that will open this November. And in November of next year, we'll, we'll be doing a, a third exhibition as part of the series, which will take Shunga and the questions of Japanese sexuality up into the 20th century. So do keep your eye out in the, in the schedule for that. Uh, today, for my talk, uh, my talk basically is, uh, falls into two sections. In the first section, I just want to talk broadly about um, the ways that we approach uh, art that deals with sexuality in, in Japanese art and, and make a few comments about that and raise a few questions for you to think about as, as you're going through the exhibition. Uh, then for the second part of the talk, time permitting, I want to take you on a little guided tour of the pleasure quarters and the, 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 the kinds of people that you might have met there if you could uh, step through time and go back to the 18th century in Japan. Um, so let's start with the first part of the talk. Uh, the first thing I want to introduce to you a little bit are uh, the, the different social categories for women that, that are revealed in uh, Japanese art during the, the 17th and 18th centuries. And most of my talk today will be about the 17th and 18th centuries. It does change quite a bit over time, so you'll see a, a, a very different type of, of art in our second exhibition having to do with the 19th century. But um, during the 17th and 18th centuries, it, it is uh, quite an interesting starting point. 
for considering uh, issues related to sexuality in the arts in Japan, just to think about the, 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 the different uh, types into which women were organized in, in Japanese society during the, the early to mid Edo period. And our, our source book for that is a book called The Elementary Learning for Women, which was published in the 18th century, around 1763. Uh, here you see uh, 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 one page from a, a, a section of, of this book that uh, the title reads something like um, Establishing Social Categories or Social Classes for Women. Uh, now, the, the Elementary Learning for Women was not a Shunga book. It didn't have anything to do with sex. Uh, it was rather a, a type of household manual that was intended for women during the, the 18th century, rather like uh, an 18th century version of Cosmopolitan magazine, if, if you will. Uh, one thing that's interesting about that and that we'll uh, come back to several times uh, an idea during this talk is the fact that the elementary learning for women was for women. And in fact, uh, it was a book that was directed primarily towards a female audience. Uh, it's a, a reflection of the fact that uh, over the course of the Edo period, uh, there was a, a quite a rising literacy rate for, for women during the Edo period, and that has some relationship to, to Shingo, which we'll come back to a little bit later on. But uh, returning to the idea of different social categories for women, uh, the elementary learning for women provides illustrations of different types of women and divides them up into uh, a, a few different categories, some of which are social classes and some of which are social types, and they don't really make a clear distinction between those two categories. Uh, for example, no, I don't have a, a laser pointer with me. I may jump away from the microphone a little bit to let you know, but the, in the lower register, the image that you see on the, let's see, it would be on your right here, is a depiction of a noble woman, which of course would be the, 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 the type that you'd have to start off with as the highest social class. Uh, next to her is a, a depiction of a woman from a, a family that has a surname, so again, a, a, a relatively high class. Uh, you could think samurai in, 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 in this particular case. Moving on, the, the, the next few pages outline, ah, thank you. Let's see. I don't want to blind anybody with this. Um, uh, again, going from the right, the first category that you see is a, a, a wife. Uh, one thing that's very interesting, if you think about the, the Edo period, if you pick up virtually any book on social classes during the Edo period that's written today, uh, you'll find that the discussion is, is largely about the merchant class, which was a, a rising class with considerable wealth and, and influence over the course of the Edo period, and particularly in the 18th century. However, the merchant class is not explicitly identified or included in the classes that are, that are outlined in the elementary learning for women. However, there's a little footnote under uh, the, the, the illustration of a wife indicating that she's a, a, a city-style wife or a chofu wife, um, uh, which indicates that she's probably meant to reflect the merchant class, meant to reflect uh, uh, the, the, the wealthy uh, merchants in Edo. Uh, right next to her are, is a depiction of a commoner. So I guess I can use my laser pointer now. Right here, you see commoner, which would be the, 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 the dominant agricultural class in Edo during the time. Uh, then we get into a few social types of women. Here you see an unmarried woman. And here you see an older sister. And then finally, the last two categories are prostitute, which you see here, and nun, which you see here. Now, the juxtaposition of prostitute and nun is in itself quite a fascinating juxtaposition, and I, I, I will talk just a little bit more about that. But before I do, the, the one idea that I really want you to take away from this introduction to my talk is the fact that during the Edo period, uh, prostitution was legal and prostitutes were a recognized social category uh, during the Edo period. They weren't a, a, a category that was outside of society. In fact, there was a, a social class, a social type that was recognized as, as a prostitute. Now, uh, that sounds like a very simple statement, but if you consider our modern perspective and, and, and where we're coming from, it actually means that prostitutes were looked at in a radically different way from the way that we typically would look at a, a, a prostitute uh, as, a, as a type of woman during the, the early 21st century in Honolulu or in the rest of the United States. And uh, think about that a little bit over the, the, the course of my talk because the, the, the repercussions of it are, are really quite significant and, and quite profound. Now, um, it does seem rather odd at, at first glance. Oh, by the way, the, um, 
title for prostitute that's given here, and as I go through my talk, you'll notice that we have to be very careful about the language that we use, and it's always a good idea to refer back to what the Japanese language is that's being used, because it often has very different connotations than a lot of the words that we have today, like all of the connotations that go along with the word prostitute, for example. Uh, the title that's being used here is a variation on the, the, the typical title for a prostitute during the, the Edo period and before in Japan. Uh, the term of which literally with different characters than the characters are used here, but the same pronunciation, it's k say, uh, that literally means a castle toppler. It means a, a, a woman who's so powerful that she can bring down a government, uh, that she can bring down a nation. And it's uh, quite interesting to think about that with the fact that, that uh, prostitutes were among the only social categories of women during the Edo period that were recognized for their sexuality. And I think the, 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 the implications of the power that sexuality gave to these women, the fact that they could literally bring down a government or bring down a nation, through, uh, through the power of their sexuality is, is, is really quite a, a remarkable thing to think about. Now, um, uh, you may wonder why, uh, why the poor nun got uh, relegated to uh, the, the, the position even, even after the prostitute. Um, in, in fact, there, there was some connection uh, socially between nuns and, and prostitutes in Japan that goes back much earlier than the Edo period. And in fact, nuns do quite frequently appear in Shunga. Um, one of the reasons for this is the fact that there were uh, a number of itinerant nuns uh, traveling around the country uh, really throughout uh, most of Japanese history after Buddhism was introduced. And it was not uncommon for these nuns to serve as uh, uh, prostitutes on the side. Uh, so it's, it's not uh, particularly unusual to see nuns uh, in, in situations, in sexual situations, and sometimes in sexual situations for pay. Now, there's, no, um, there's nothing that necessarily indicates that the nun here is serving as a prostitute. She could just simply be having sex. And, and in, um, in the interest of fairness between the sexes, I should point out that um, it's not just nuns that are frequently depicted in Shunga. Uh, monks often are frequently depicted in Shunga as well. And we'll see uh, at least one example of that as we go through our talk. Um, another example here, just so that you know that it's not an isolated example that I, I picked out of a, a, a nun having, having sex. Uh, this is a particularly interesting example because of the fact that uh, uh, there's actually Shunga within Shunga in, in, in this uh, work. If you notice the book that's sitting to the side there, it actually, the book itself has an explicit image of a, a couple having sex. And they're dressed in uh, classical robes that, that date back to the Heian period. Um, now, moving on a little bit. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the words that we use to describe uh, 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 sexual imagery in, in Japanese art today and what the implications of those words sometimes can be. And this is something that if you get a chance to go back and look, look up through the exhibition, I want you to really think about and have in the back of your mind as, as you're walking through the exhibition because it is quite interesting how a lot of the implications of the words that we use uh, change over time and how they're not necessarily the same implications as, as what the implications for the Japanese terms would have been. Uh, let's start off with a, a, a relatively innocuous looking image here. This is uh, one of the most famous prints from our collection. Uh, and uh, a typical title for this print, if you were to walk into a museum anywhere around the world today, or at least 20 or 30 years ago, would have been simply beauty. Um, now, uh, the, there, there's a, a rather complex reason why this, uh, why this uh, uh, term was used. If you look at the actual Japanese title that's up in the corner of the print there, it identifies her as a high-ranking prostitute, or Taiyu, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Taiyu in a bit, but, but Taiyu were the highest category of prostitute. Uh, she's actually named, her name was Tsukasa, and she worked in a brothel in Osaka, in the, the, the Shinmachi district of Osaka, which was the licensed prostitution district of Osaka, uh, in a brothel called the, uh, the East Ogia, or the East uh, Fan Shop in, in, uh, in Osaka. Um, uh, so uh, the, the word beauty is, is a little disingenuous here. It's actually uh, rather masking over what the original social context of this woman that's clearly identified in the print would be. Now, why would we have not, right from the start, just simply identified this print as prostitute? Well, 
um, when uh, collectors were falling in love with Japanese prints in the early part of the 20th century, and really even before that, really going all the way back to the beginnings of when these prints were made, uh, there was always an attempt to sort of um, mask over the, 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 the implications of these prints as, as being of people who, who were involved in the sex industry. There was always an attempt to glamorize them and to romanticize them, and particularly during the 20th century when Japanese prints spread to the rest of the world, uh, a lot of curators and collectors and museums wanted to legitimize this art form and wanted it to be considered as, as something that was appropriate to be displayed in, in their galleries. For that reason, they, they, they really tended to av avoid any sort of terminology that might be considered controversial. It's quite fascinating if you ever get the chance to go back and read a book about Japanese woodblock prints from the 1950s or the 1960s, how little discussion of, of prostitution there is in those books and how much discussion there is uh, uh, attempting to really glamorize these, these women and to, um, and to emphasize uh, virtually everything but what they did for, for a profession. And that's something that we do still tend to, uh, tend to have a bad habit of doing uh, even, even today. And of, of course, I'm just as guilty of that and our museum is just as guilty of that as anybody in the rest of the world. Um, now, because the idea of calling an image like this beauty is so disingenuous, eventually people kind of started to move away from that a little bit and started to use the word courtesan instead. Uh, if you walk into virtually any museum anywhere in the world or open up any book on Japanese woodblock prints today, typically what you'll find is that any depiction of a prostitute is referred to as a courtesan. However, if you go back and look at the original meaning of the word courtesan, you'll find that it's the female equivalent of the word courtier, which of course was just someone who was in attendance to a royal court. Uh, so at its uh, original derivation, in fact, the word courtesan refers to a very high social class that had virtually nothing to do with prostitution whatsoever. Um, uh, of course, eventually courtesan came to be used for the private mistresses of people in, in these noble courts, and, and that isn't an entirely inappropriate usage when you're talking about uh, 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 prostitutes during the Edo period. In fact, in the very early Edo period, it's uh, interesting to note that a number of women who went into the prostitution houses during the early Edo period, in fact, did come from the highest ranks of society. When the Tokugawa family took control of the country, a lot of the other families who were on the wrong side of that struggle uh, found themselves in very dire straits, and a number of women from those families uh, entered into prostitution as the only way that they had to, to support themselves. Uh, so uh, very early on in the Edo period, in fact, uh, uh, a number of prostitutes had been courtesans before they started to serve as, as prostitutes. They had been members of, 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 of a very high-ranking social, uh, social categories. Um, uh, now, uh, again, the, um, the, the, the Japanese title for this, uh, this is a specifically identified woman. Her name was Karagoto, and she served, if I remember correctly, aren't so good anymore, in the uh, Chojia, which was a brothel in, uh, in Edo, in, in the Yoshiwara. So she's simply identified by, by her name and by her brothel in, in, in the print. There's no sense of any kind of a particular social category for her, although Karagoto was a very high-ranking prostitute and, and, and certainly one of the most famous prostitutes of her time. Now let's move on a little bit more and look at another similar image. But if we change, um, I've kind of given away the secret because I've already been reusing the word prostitute a lot. Uh, but prostitute, honestly, is probably the most appropriate word to use for these women because the root of it simply means that um, they were paid in advance, which in, in fact isn't entirely true for courtesans. They were paid after the fact, but of course the price was negotiated uh, up front. Um, uh, however, uh, prostitute is a difficult word for us to use today when we're talking about images of the sex industry in Japan because it does have a, a, a lot of implications, a lot of connotations that go along with it. And if you look at the image that I chose for this, I tried to choose an image from, uh, Japanese, uh, from our, our Japanese print collection that would really capture some of the connotations, the modern connotations that we have that go along with the word prostitute. Uh, in fact, the, the, the Japanese title for this print uh, can be loosely translated as vulgarly, vulgarly called the wanton, uh, 
Uh, you see a, a, a woman who is uh, certainly of, of, of very questionable behavior. Uh, you can see that her dress is quite slovenly and that her robe has fallen open, her breast is exposed. Uh, she's drinking alcohol and eating to excess and uh, just exudes social impropriety on, on, on every level. Uh, now, however, I'm actually being a little disingenuous myself here because there's uh, uh, something that you should know about this print. Uh, I'll give you a little mini quiz here. Does anybody want to guess why this print is actually a, a, an inappropriate image to choose along with a discussion of the word prostitute? Don't be shy. Anybody? She's actually not a prostitute. There's nothing in the print anywhere that indicates her as, 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 as a prostitute. In fact, of this group of prints that I'm talking about, this is the only one in the entire group where it isn't of a specifically identified and named prostitute. In fact, this is just a generic social type. Uh, and and the, all of the, the, the connotations of slovenliness, of social impropriety, of excessive drinking, uh, of, of improper behavior, things like that, uh, those connotations uh, did not go along with the idea of prostitution during the Edo period. It was a very different set of connotations than what our ideas about prostitution are today. Uh, when we look at this image today, we immediately think, ah, that's a very appropriate image of a prostitute. But during the Edo period, that would not at all have been the case. You'll notice that all of the images of prostitutes that we look at in fact show women with a very high degree of cultural sophistication uh, and a very elegant behavior. Let's see. And then finally, uh, the, the last term that we might use to refer to these women under our modern standards would be sex slave. Uh, now, it's, uh, I, I'm hoping, a very jarring juxtaposition for you to put up the term sex slave along with the image that you see there. Uh, the image is of uh, a, a woman named Somenosuke, who was one of the most famous uh, prostitutes from one of the most famous brothels in the Oshiwara the Matsubaya. In fact, Somenosuke was so famous that her name was handed down from person to person and it actually became a lineage that went over several decades uh, from the end of the 18th century into the, the 19th century. So uh, a, a woman of, of, of uh, quite of some celebrity and, and renown during the Edo period. Uh, but uh, in, in a lot of ways the term sex slave would be an entirely appropriate term for uh, the, the, the social context of, 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 uh, of women who worked in the, in the prostitution industry during the Edo period. In some ways, it's not really appropriate, and, and, and hopefully I'll get a chance to show you a little bit of that, time permitting. But it was very much the case that uh, the, the women that were, in, that were working in the Yoshiwara were under contract with their brothels, and that in order to fulfill that contract, they had to raise a certain amount of money uh, to, to buy out their contract. In fact, uh, the cases where women over the course of their careers were able to raise enough money to buy out their contract themselves seems to have been quite rare. Usually it was the brothel that terminated the contract once the women became too old and then it was no longer uh, uh, of benefit to the brothel to have them working there. Uh, over the course of their careers, most women were in a state of, of perpetual indebtedness to the brothels that they worked for to the point where they really virtually were slaves. Uh, they were never allowed to leave the Oshiwara and uh, in fact a lot of the, the common images that you see of the Oshiwara will show lower levels of prostitutes literally sitting behind bars lined up on, on, on the street and we'll, we'll get to some of that in, in a little bit. But I, 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 I want you to think about all of these terms because in a certain sense they're all appropriate and they all have the right context for talking about images of women that were involved in the sex industry during the Edo period. In a lot of other senses though, they don't really fit. Uh, uh, all of these terms, uh, beauty, courtesan, prostitute, sex slave, can all be used. Each one of them captures one particular aspect of what the lives of these women would have been like. But in our, from our modern perspective, they also bring in a lot of different connotations that aren't always entirely appropriate to the historical context in which this art was made. Now let's move on a little bit uh, to, to, to do another example of, uh, of uh, some interesting juxtapositions between name and image. Uh, we'll start off with a relatively innocuous image here, uh, which I, I believe is actually, this is the title that we give this image in, uh, in, in our collection. I think it's, uh, uh, the full title is something like Two Lovers Sharing an Umbrella. 
uh, but two lovers would be a very typical generic title for an image like this. Uh, it, it is seemingly a very innocent uh, and charming image of, uh, of, of two young lovers sharing an umbrella together. Um, I, I should point out that, uh, that the umbrella was often used as a sexual symbol in, 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 in Japanese art, and particularly as, as a phallic symbol. It's not unusual at all to see a woman tugging on a, a man's umbrella in, in Shunga with, uh, with all of the implications that, that would go along with that. Uh, however, that doesn't seem to be in any way explicit here. Uh, in fact, this image is so charming and so innocent there, that there's actually a lovely folk story. That, that, that goes along with it, uh, almost a, a fairy tale, if you will. Uh, because the man is dressed in black and the woman is dressed in a, a very rich uh, brocade white robe, typically they're associated with a raven and a heron, a uh, black and a white bird, which brings up, uh, which would have conjured for anybody at the time, the story of the heron maiden. I'm sure some of you are, are familiar with this story already, but the heron maiden story is a story about a, a young man who finds a, a heron with a broken wing and he nurses it back to health and releases it. Uh, sometime after that, he meets a beautiful woman, they fall in love, they get married, and uh, she has tremendous talent in weaving, so she weaves this beautiful brocade silk cloth which brings great wealth to the couple. And of course, that's referred to in the, in the cloth that, that, that you see the, the woman wearing. And by the way, if you want to take a close look at this print, this print will be on display in an upcoming exhibition called Allure, which will be opening at the museum at, at the end of March. So you will get a chance. And I, I highly recommend that you come in and take a look at it because there's a lot of blind printing, a lot of embossing, in particularly the white robe that really uh, adds a, a dimension of beauty to it. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, the, the, the maiden weaves this beautiful fabric and she says, I'm, I'm happy to make the fabric, but you can never come in and watch me while I'm weaving the fabric. Now, of course, this means that he has to spy on her and find out what's going on. Uh, when he spies on her, he finds that, in fact, uh, she's actually the heron that he saved uh, uh, sometime earlier and that her true form, she reveals her true form when she's weaving the fabric. Once he's discovered this, of course, they can no longer stay together and she has to leave him, so it's a tragic story at the end, but something that would fit quite nicely into Grimm's fairy tales, I think. Um, now, this print is, is by Suzuki Harunobu, the, the first great print designer of multicolor woodblock prints. Now, let's take a look at another image by Harunobu from around the same time, which again could equally appropriately be called Two Lovers. Um, at first glance, this image, uh, like the previous one that we were looking at, appears relatively innocuous. Uh, in fact, it appears so innocuous that uh, when we were originally selecting uh, promotional images for our Shunga exhibition, we chose this as one of the non-explicit images to use uh, and uh, almost wound up blasting this all over the newspaper and the magazines and, and our websites in, in Honolulu. But if you look closely at the print in this area right here, you'll see that the women's genitalia are, 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 are actually revealed. Um, now, um, for us, from our modern perspective, this puts the print into an entirely different category than the print that we were just looking at. And you may at this point think that I'm being a little disingenuous again by using the same title and simply calling it Two Lovers. Uh, but I do have a specific purpose in doing that because for the government during the Edo period, this print may have been considered a little bit differently than the print that we were just looking at. But for an average audience during the Edo period, among the people who were largely buying these prints, I don't think that they would have considered there to have been any significant difference between the print that we were just looking at and this print. Uh, they both had certainly uh, a, a, a background of, of, of sexual tension in them and, uh, and, and a lot of implied sexual, uh, sexual symbolism that was in them. But at the same time, they were uh, really both very close to each other, dealing with the same kind of subject, dealing with the same kind of topic by the same artist in the same way. And uh, there, I, 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 it, while we tend to um, isolate explicit imagery today and to consider it as something very different than non-explicit imagery, this is really very much a modern concept and we need to be careful about uh, applying this concept to the way that people would have looked at things at the time that the art was made. Now let's take it a step further. One more print, also by Haranobu, from around the same time period of the same subject. 
Uh, but here, of course, the, 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 the difference is quite obvious. It, it, it is a, a sexually explicit image. Uh, it is worth noting that Haranobu often made variations on his designs where he would do one design that was non-explicit and one design that was explicit of exactly the same design. So you would find a print like this, but just where their genitalia were covered rather than, than, than being exposed. Um, a little bit later on, artists, once they had the ability to do more sophisticated printing techniques, would do things like do a flap overlay over an image where when the flap was laid down, it would be non-explicit, but when you lifted the flap up, then you'd lift the robe up and actually see what was going on underneath the robe. Um, again, though, I, I think when you look at this by stages, that there's not a, a, a great there's not a great distance between the first print that we were looking at, the second print that we were looking at, and now this very explicit third image that we're looking at. For an audience at the time, they all would have been part of the same continuum. Um, it's it's really not like we used to to joke about our, our Shunga exhibition that we really wanted to avoid the feeling, you know, like how when you used to go into a video store to rent a video, that there'd be one little corner back in the back with a little curtain hanging up there, and uh, you'd have to go back through the curtain in order to, 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 to see the explicit videos. Uh, Shunga was not like that during the Edo period. Shunga was, uh, was really a, a one category of ukiyo-e, one category of, of, of Japanese woodblock prints, and it was really considered in a lot of ways on equal footing with all of the other categories of, of, of Japanese woodblock prints. It wasn't something that was uh, particularly dirty or, unacce or unacceptable or had uh, particularly negative social connotations to it. Now that, of course, for the government sometimes wasn't the case. Uh, the government did, uh, in, in, in many times over the course of the Edo period, uh, enact specific laws against Shunga. However, what's interesting about these laws is the fact that they never outlawed explicit imagery specifically. What they outlawed were images that would be morally corrupting to society. And in fact, they didn't consider all explicit imagery to be morally corrupting. Uh, if it was explicit imagery that encouraged healthy sex, that was just fine for the government. What they were concerned about was anything that would create a, 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 a negative influence on, on society. And they didn't consider explicit imagery in general to, to be a negative influence on, on society. Um, by the way, uh, this depicts a, a tryst between a young woman and a fan salesman. Uh, fan salesmen were sort of the pool boys of, of the 18th century during the Edo period. Uh, it's surprising once you've seen a, a Shunga image like this, how often you find non-explicit images of fan salesmen passing by a woman's house and a woman inviting, her, in, inviting him in to, to take a look at the fans that he has for sale. Of course, with those non-explicit images, the implication was the very same implication as what you see here. Uh, I, I, I think it's very rare to find an instance where the woman was actually inviting the fan salesman into the house because she wanted to look at his fans. I think she was much more interested in looking at, at, at other offerings that he had. Let's see. Now, um, let's move on to uh, the, the next question that I want you to think about when you're, when you're thinking about uh, sexual, images, uh, sexual imagery in Japanese art in general, and particularly um, Shunga. Uh, it was interesting to us uh, that um, before we did the exhibition in the months leading up to us, we did have a few people uh, ask for special meetings with us to come and talk about the fact that they were very concerned that we were doing an exhibition on pornography and that they didn't think that a museum of our reputation should, should, uh, should be involved in promoting pornography in, in Honolulu. So that raised the question for us, well, is Shunga pornography? Is that an appropriate way to, to, to classify it? Um, uh, of course, we were hoping that, 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 that it wouldn't turn out to be pornography, but we didn't start off with the assumption that it necessarily wasn't pornography. Um, in thinking about that, I wanted to get the, the, the common man's take on what pornography was. So I went to Wikipedia and, and pulled out the definition that Wikipedia provides of, of pornography. Um, I won't dwell on, on all of it too much, uh, although I have to admit that I do especially enjoy the rather quaint attempt to distinguish pornography from erotica, which is the portrayal of sexuality with high art aspirations. I thought that that was a, a, a very nice phrasing. Uh, what I do really want to focus on, though, is the passage in red that says, while pornography involves the depiction of acts in a sensational manner with the entire focus on the physical act so as to arouse quick, intense reactions. 
and above that the fact that the consumers of pornography particularly hardcore pornography are assumed to be men so I, I think we can uh, uh, we can uh, uh, make this a little more concise with the premise that a fundamental definition of pornography would be uh, the, the, the fact that fundamental to identifying something as pornography is its intended use for autoeroticism and specifically for autoeroticism by men. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, there is a, a, a marvelous book by Time and Screech. Uh, I think it's called something like uh, Sexuality and Edo Culture. And uh, uh, Tymon's uh, argument uh, throughout the book is largely to prove that Shunga, in fact, was used almost entirely for masturbation. Um, uh, I, I think that we've tried to prove that's not the case in, in our exhibition, and a lot of other people have argued that point, but I want to show you a few examples of that and explore this question in, in, in a little more detail. Let's see, now first of all, it is quite common in Shunga to find uh, images of people looking at Shunga. And I think that it's, it's uh, quite fascinating to consider the ways in which they're looking at Shunga. In fact, uh, the large majority of depictions that I've seen of people looking at Shunga uh, tend to be uh, non-explicit. Uh, for example, here you see, uh, in fact, I know it looks like a woman, but it's, it's not. It's actually a wakashu, which is a separate gender category. Um, anatomically male, um, and you'll get a chance to learn a lot more about Wakashu during the, the, the film this evening. But um, uh, certainly a very feminized image that you see here of someone. But they're looking at uh, a, a Shunga book as, as they would look at any other illustrated book. I think it would be a, a, a little unfair on our part to assume that there was a, 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 an act of autoeroticism that was immediately to follow this scene. There doesn't seem to be anything within the scene itself that implies that. In fact, um, I, I don't think it's unreasonable at all to uh, posit the idea that sex, sexuality, was very much a part of the human experience, which had unique aesthetic potential for artists. Artists appreciated doing uh, uh, sexual imagery because of its aesthetic potential, and people enjoyed looking at that imagery because of its aesthetic potential. I, 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 I have a hard time understanding why anyone would have a, a, a difficulty with the idea that someone might look at these images as, as art. That's exactly what we're doing today. That's exactly what we've been doing through the exhibition for the last three months, and it seems entirely reasonable to me. Um, it seems to be very much backed up by the numerous images of people just looking at Shunga without any further sexual activity that you find within Shunga itself. On the other hand, there is one type of art in Japanese art that is consistently shown as an aid to autoeroticism, of which this is an especially nice, uh, an especially nice example of, of an image. Um, here you see a, 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 a picture of a, a woman that's entirely non-explicit. In this particular case, it's a hanging scroll, but it could just as well be a, a woodblock print. And uh, she's fully dressed. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing explicit about it. Her genitalia are not revealed. There, she's not having sex. There's no partner involved there. Uh, but yet the man has rolled up part of the scroll and he has an artificial vagina underneath that he's using to, uh, to take advantage of it. Um, this is a variety of imagery that you find uh, remarkably frequently in, in, in Shunga. Um, sometimes you'll see a case where someone is taking a, taking a hanging scroll like this, uh, a depiction of a, a, a prostitute, or just a beautiful woman in general, laid it down on the floor and then laid a mattress over it and, and, and is actually laying on top of the mattress. There are a lot of different variations that you see. But uh, at the end of the day, the important question to raise from an image like this is, okay, this type of image is being used as pornography, do we then apply the term to something like this? Think about that for just a second. Is this pornography? Would you, uh, in a different context, if we had this hanging in our gallery, as we have many times over the, pa over the past decades, if you walked in and saw this painting hanging in our gallery, would you immediately think of the word pornography? Probably not. Now let's go on to another image. Here you see a woman who's uh, masturbating to a print of a kabuki actor. Kabuki actors were the celebrities, the male celebrities of, of their day, and so it, it seems entirely appropriate in that regard. This is by uh, Utagawa Toyokuni I, 
Toyo Kuni himself was a very famous designer of actor prints, and so he's actually uh, doing a little bit of self-promotion by showing the woman enjoying one of his prints that, 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 that he's designed. Um, now, there are a, a, a couple of uh, things that are interesting about this image. The first is the fact that, once again, the act of autoeroticism has nothing to do with a sexually explicit image. And in fact, uh, the, the, the very fact that the image is, is not uh, uh, sexually explicit charges it with a different kind of eroticism that's very important for the Edo period. Uh, the other thing that I want you to notice about this is that the uh, depicted consumer of, of this uh, erotica, or let's go ahead and, and use the word pornography for this print, the depicted consumer is actually a woman, not, not, not a man, which is quite common in, in Shunga. But again, let me raise the question, is this pornography? If you were to walk into our gallery and see this on display, would you immediately think pornography? This is a, an actor print by Toyo Kuni, the very artist that we were just looking at in, in, in the previous image. Uh, again, uh, we've had this print on our display, uh, uh, or in our galleries on display, many times over, over the course of the last several decades. I don't believe we've ever gotten a complaint from anyone that we were displaying pornography. In, in our galleries. Uh, but what is really ironic about this is that, in fact, to an Edo, to the mind of an average Edo person, uh, what really fits most closely with our modern conception of pornography, a highly sexually charged imagery that would have been used for the purpose of autoeroticism, are in fact these non-explicit images that we've been looking at. Um, I, I, I often joke with our Shunga exhibition, uh, since we put it up, that we're not currently doing an exhibition of pornography in the museum, but in fact, if you were to go to our regular galleries and look at the exhibitions of Japanese prints that we've been doing for the last 80 years, we have a long and proud tradition of doing exhibitions of pornography in our museum. Um, now, um, I don't want to say that Shunga is never shown being used for acts of autoeroticism, because it is. And uh, here you see a case where a woman is enjoying a Shunga book that's uh, right down in front of her there, and of course there's something else going on over over on the other side of the book, um, uh, and 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 it is uh, uh, it, it is uh, something that you see sometimes in Shunga. Uh, in, in fact, though, it's surprisingly uncommon, uh, given how how much more you might expect images like this to occur. Um, uh, looking through uh, uh, three or four hundred different books for uh, the preparation of this exhibition, I think I found maybe three or four images. Of, of, of this type, uh, with a typical book having anywhere from five or six to 20 or 30 images. So you can imagine that's a very low percentage for, uh, for the idea of Shunga being used as an aid for, for autoeroticism. Um, uh, again, though, one thing that, that, that violates the standard definition of pornography that we've been looking at is that the depicted audience for Shunga in this, in this case is uh, a woman, not, not, not a man. Um, now, uh, you may come back with the argument that this is a male fantasy that's being shown, and the fact that a, a woman is being shown looking at Shunga doesn't necessarily mean that women actually looked at Shunga. In fact, men probably like to think that women were looking at Shunga, whether they were or not. Um, that could be. Uh, it's a reasonable argument to make. However, uh, there is a lot of other anecdotal evidence to suggest that uh, some shunga uh, uh, certainly was enjoyed by women, and in fact, some shunga may have been made uh, specifically for uh, a female audience. Um, one example that I'll mention and that you can see up on display in the galleries is, uh, remember the very first book that we looked at, The Elementary Learning for Women. Uh, that is a, a book that was in, intended entirely for a female audience. It was various advice on how to manage your household and all of the different things that a woman needed to know in order to be a, a successful wife and, and, and family manager during the Edo period. Um, one of the, the Shunga books that we have in our collection is in fact a direct parody of these learning manuals for women. And I don't think that it's unreasonable to speculate on some solid ground that if the original book that's being parodied was intended primarily for women, that it probably would have been women who, mostly, who most would have appreciated the, the sexual parody of, of that very same book. Uh, so it, it, it seems entirely reasonable to think that a, 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 a fair amount of Shunga that was produced during the Edo period, a fair amount of explicit imagery, uh, could very well have been intended for a, a female audience. Uh, there also are a lot of stories in, uh, in, in uh, the Edo period, including some very famous stories like the Chushin Gura, uh, 
uh, that talk about uh, uh, women ordering uh, women ordering shunga and it being uh, specifically for for their collections. So it doesn't seem unreasonable at all to think that that, that that shunga may have been intended for women, and that makes it something very different than what our typical modern conception of pornography would be. Um, now, again, uh, by far the most common image, and, and I'm not um, I, I'm not picking on nuns here. I I, I, I promise, but. Uh, uh, this image just happened to be a convenient illustration of what is by far the most common depiction of Shunga and its use in a sexual act, and that is Shunga as it's being used by couples when they're, when they're having sex. Uh, this is, 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 is very frequent in Shunga. It's not unusual at all to find Shunga as uh, being a, a, a stimulatory aid to, uh, to uh, uh, sex between couples or to find couples otherwise in, enjoying Shunga. And of course you can see the Shunga book again, right, right down here. Um, so um, again, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that Shunga wasn't intended in some cases to be titillating or to be stimulating, but it, it really is a very different kind of idea than, than what we would normally associate with modern pornography. Let's see. How am I doing? Okay, I've got a little bit of time. Let's take a, a, a short tour of, of the Yoshiwara and, and the pleasure quarters here. Uh, we won't get all the way through, but I'll get you into the pleasure quarters and then I'll let you find your own way out after the talk is over. Um, now, uh, as we were doing this exhibition, we realized that an exhibition about Shunga alone really wasn't such an interesting idea. Uh, we started off planning the exhibition uh, because we have about 800 works of Shunga in our collection. So we started off with the idea that this is an important part of our collection, we need to do something with it. Uh, we have 800 works that, are, that, that deal with sexuality during the Edo culture. However, when we started to take a really close look at our collection, we realized that it, it isn't necessarily a requirement of uh, an image that it has to do with sexuality, that it is a graphic depiction of sexuality. And in fact, there are a lot of other ways that sexuality was explored in the arts during the Edo period, of which by far the most common was a depiction of uh, the pleasure quarters and, and the industry of sex, the business of sex. When we opened it up uh, and started thinking about it that way, we realized that in fact we have uh, about 10,000 works of art in our collection that have to do with sexuality in, in Edo culture. It's really staggering what an important theme sexuality was during the Edo period in, in the arts. And it's uh, really undeniable the significance of, of, of sexuality as one of the major subjects that Japanese artists were exploring. But the large majority of those images are an exploration of uh, sexuality through the, the, the sex industry and through the pleasure quarters. Now I want to start off with an image uh, that is in fact not of the Yoshiwara, because if you've heard of any one pleasure quarter in Japan, you've probably heard of the Yoshiwara. Some of you may even have thought that the Yoshiwara was the only licensed pleasure quarter in Japan. The Yoshiwara, of course, being the licensed pleasure quarter that was in the capital city of Edo. However, there were licensed pleasure quarters throughout Japan. Uh, at the time that the Yoshiwara was established, there were already, if I remember correctly, about 20 licensed pleasure quarters that were all around the, 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 the country. Uh, the image that you see here is of Shinmachi, which was the licensed pleasure quarter in Osaka. In fact, uh, uh, in addition to uh, having a major licensed pleasure quarter, Osaka was a very important center for the production, uh, for the publication of Shunga as well, and had its own distinct tradition, some examples of which you've actually already seen. Um, this particular image depicts the uh, Ageya district of, of uh, Shinmachi. Ageya were uh, houses of assignation where clients would go and, and request a meeting with, a, with a, uh, their, their prostitutes, and then the prostitutes would come and meet them there, and then eventually over the course of the evening, if they were lucky, sometimes the prostitutes would take them back to their own quarters. But generally, the first meetings, at least early on, up through around the middle of the 18th century, were done at these houses of assignation. And you can see a number of different houses that are depicted throughout there. Um, yeah, now, in, in thinking about the fact that there were pleasure quarters all over Japan, uh, uh, one uh, set of three prints that we have in the exhibition is particularly interesting in this regard. Uh, the set is by Okumura Masanobu. It's originally a set of 12 prints, of which we have three in our collection, and it depicts uh, the pleasure quarters first in Osaka, which you, which you see here. One thing that's interesting you'll notice about all three of these prints is that there's nothing explicit 
about them at all. The way that uh, uh, Masanobu conveys sexuality is through very subtle imagery that goes on around the couple. For example, in this particular print, if you notice right here, there's a, a, a branch of a cherry blossom that's been broken off. Uh, the cherry blossom, of course, was a symbol for a, a, a young beauty in, in Japan, and the idea of breaking off a, cherry, a, a branch of a cherry blossom was an idea of seducing a, a, a young beauty and, and, and having a sexual relationship with her. So it's implied very subtly in, in the print. Um, uh, uh, again, you see a depiction here of, uh, of uh, Shimabar, which was the licensed pleasure quarter in Kyoto. Um, uh, in case you're wondering what they're doing, the man has actually laid out his coat and they're playing a game of, uh, sort of a game of checkers, if you will. For any of you who play Go, it's uh, five in a row, which is a simplified version of, of, of Go that some of you may have played before. Some of you may go home after this and want to play it tonight. Um, uh, uh, but that's what's going on below. Um, again, uh, Masanobu has included uh, some subtle sexual imagery in the shakuhachi flute, which you see being used as a bass here, which of course, when you think about it, is an obvious phallic symbol. And then finally, uh, the Yoshiwara in, in Edo, which is uh, the, 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 the last print that we see here. Um, this is a particularly interesting image. We probably should update our title a little bit. Uh, what's going on here is that a, a, a courtesan is in the middle of a meeting with a client and another client has sent her a letter in, in, in the middle of this meeting. Uh, so her young attendant has snuck in and covered up her client's eyes while she sneaks the letter to, to, to the prostitute so that she can see it. This seems to have been quite a common occurrence uh, during, the, during the Edo period. In fact, there was a whole social protocol for what you did if you were interrupted uh, uh, in the middle of meeting uh, a client by another client. Interestingly enough, if another client insisted that he had to meet with the courtesan that evening, it was generally considered good form for you to give up your meeting with the courtesan and allow him to take your place in, in, instead. Uh, I, I don't exactly know how that worked, but, it, but if you didn't do that, you were generally considered to be boorish, uh, during, 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 at least in the Yoshiwara. Now, um, actually, let's skip over this because I'm, I'm running low on time. Uh, the, the, the only date that I'm going to, to emphasize here, uh, and it doesn't have much to do with my talk, but I do think it's very interesting, and it may be something that, that a lot of you aren't aware of, is if you look at the very last date there, do you see when the Yoshiwara was finally closed? 1958. Think about that for a minute. That's what, eight plus five, that's 14 years after the US occupation of Japan when the Yoshiwara was finally closed. Now, uh, you'll also notice the date right above that, that the Yoshiwara was often uh, uh, completely devastated by fire. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that the Yoshiwara was exempt from providing uh, uh, people to serve in the fire brigade of, brigade of Edo. And so the story goes that because the firemen of Edo uh, were upset with the Yoshiwara because they didn't have to come out and help when the rest of Edo was burning. So whenever the Yoshiwara set on fire, the other fire brigades would refuse to come and help. Uh, which meant that fires, which were already a very common problem during the Edo period, were particularly a problem. Uh, in, in the Yoshiwara, and you can see that the, 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 the dates for when the Yoshiwara was completely destroyed by fire uh, just go on and on over the course of the 18th and, and the 19th centuries. For this reason, uh, the Yoshiwara uh, often was allowed to uh, uh, temporarily establish itself outside of, of, of its regular quarter, and it's quite uh, interesting, this depiction by Utamaro of uh, uh, at, uh, a scene of mourning at a temporary lodgings. Uh, it seems as though the temporary lodgings, when the, the brothels were allowed to uh, set up outside of the Yoshiwara for a little while, uh, uh, brought on much better business uh, because they were more accessible than the Yoshiwara, which was a little bit removed from the city proper. Also, it seems as though it was uh, uh, really a, a good time for everyone because a lot of the very strict regulations of the interaction between courtesans Oh, see, there I go using the word courtesans, uh, between prostitutes and, and their clients uh, in the temporary lodgings were, were greatly eased. And so they were able to interact on a much more casual basis. And one thing that's interesting about Utamaro's print is in fact how casual everyone seems and how relaxed they seem compared to the normal interactions that you see between prostitutes and clients uh, within the Yoshiwara proper. 
Let's see. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here. Oh, yeah, I have to talk about this, if you'll bear with me for just a moment. Um, the Oshuara, as the, as the broad number of brothels in the Oshuara increased, uh, it became hard for everybody to keep up with them. And so eventually they started publishing annual guides to the various brothels in the Yoshiwara. So if you wanted to pay a visit, you knew which brothels were the best ones to go to, which ones had the most attractive uh, prostitutes and the highest ranking prostitutes, how much you'd have to pay if you were going to go, and, and other ideas like that. A lot of the guides are, in fact, just maps of the different streets uh, with all of the different brothels listed uh, uh, on, on either side of the street. Uh, for example, you can see the uh, Ebia in the round circle over in, in the corner there. Now, this uh, uh, appears in a very interesting context in one of the prints that's going to be in our show in, in, in March by, uh, by Kiyonaga. Uh, in Kiyonaga's print, you can see that right here, it's a group of three women, and one of them is actually looking at uh, this guide to the Oshiwara. There you can see it blown up there, and you can compare it to our actual copy that we have in the Shunga exhibition. Uh, what's going on here, this is not a scene within the pleasure quarters. In fact, someone's wife has gotten a hold of a copy of a guide to the Yoshiwara and managed to find the address of the prostitute that her husband regularly visits. And she's latched onto it. And the, the, the poem at the, up at the top says, looking through the guidebook, ah, it's her. Uh, while all of her friends sort of look on in embarrassed amusement. Uh, typically in Japanese prints, if you see a woman covering her mouth, that's a sign that she's laughing, that she, that, that she finds something funny. You can see that her friend definitely finds this situation to be very amusing. Um, now I'm going to jump ahead a little bit more. Um, unfortunately, I only have time to introduce uh, one of the types of people that you would meet in the Yoshiwara, but I do think in some ways that it's, it's the most interesting type of, of woman that you'd meet at the Yoshiwara, and it is the starting point for everything else that, that happens in, in, in the Yoshiwara, um, and that is the Kamaro. Um, so I'm going to end my talk just by talking a little bit about Kamaro. You may wonder how women entered into the Oshiwara and what was involved in that. In fact, uh, most women uh, entered into the Oshiwara when they were only about five or six years old. As, as young children. The, 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 the term commoner literally means short-haired, and it means because your hair hasn't had a chance to grow out and, and, and become long yet. Um, now, uh, a, a lot of these commoner came from the countryside. Uh, you have to remember at the time that in Japan, uh, the life of a, a, a farmer in a rural area was a very hard life. Uh, typically, it was subsistence farming. You were generally lucky if you were able to grow enough food to feed your, yourself, and, and let alone your family. Uh, famines were very common during the Edo period, where sometimes thousands of people would starve to death. If you, uh, if you had a family in a rural area, your children had very little opportunity for education and no opportunity whatsoever for social advancement. So it was not so uncommon if you were in dire straits, if uh, someone came to you and offered to uh, purchase your daughter uh, and, 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 and provide a better setting for her, where she'd have a degree of material comfort and stability, uh, where she'd never have to worry about enough food or about warm clothing, where she could get an education and a degree of cultural sophistication, where if she was successful, she might even have a chance to better her social standing that it must have seemed like a very seductive offer to a lot of families. And in fact, uh, uh, a number of Kamaro were sold, uh, were daughters of rural families that were sold into the Oshiwara. In fact, there was an entire network of agents that went out, of scouts, if you will, that went out and scoured the countryside looking for particularly attractive young girls or particularly graceful young girls. Um, uh, uh, at, at, at the absolute darkest uh, part of it, it was very common whenever there was a natural disaster like an earthquake, uh, whenever there was a particularly bad famine in a particular region, it was very common for scouts to descend on that region and, uh, and, and, and recruit girls to, to uh, be purchased into the Oshiwara. Um, not always, but, but typically the brothels preferred to buy the girls outright so that there would be a contract of sale that would be uh, issued for, for the girl, uh, which meant that they would uh, lose all contact with, with their family. Um, now, uh, in, in return for that, and by the way, you see a Kamaro here 
uh, a young girl. Uh, I use this illustration just because uh, Suke Nobu specifically identifies all of the different figures, including Kamino, which he says right down there. Um, here you can see that, 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 that Kamino often entered into the Yoshiwara very young. Uh, from the, 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 the hairstyle of this girl on the, on the right here, you'll notice that it's still an infant's hairstyle, which means she's probably no older than about five years old. Um, my favorite image of a Kamaro is, is this image here, which is an incredibly young girl who is hiding behind her courtesan. Probably some of you have seen this print on display in the gallery before. Uh, probably some of you have seen it in books before. I'm guessing, though, that probably none of you ever stopped for a moment to think about uh, the life of this young girl and, 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 and the context in, in, in which she would have found herself being portrayed in, in this print. Now, I do want to uh, back up just a, a little bit for a moment and uh, emphasize the fact that Kamaro did not engage in prostitution. Uh, you went through a very long period of training uh, before you engaged in prostitution, and you would have been in your teens by the time that you, that, that, that you were actually taking clients. So it's not as though a girl at five or six years old would have immediately been sold into prostitution. She was uh, uh, sold into the brothels to become an assistant to uh, a high-ranking courtesan. One of the symbols of, there's the word courtesan again, one of the symbols of, of the status of a high-ranking prostitute was the fact that, uh, that she had a number of Kamaro uh, attendees. Typically, they tended, to, they tended to be depicted in pairs, usually with matching dress. Um, what's interesting to me, though, going through uh, a, a lot of the books in the Shunga exhibition and other books from our collection, is that you do get a glimpse for what the lives of, of Kamaro would have been like uh, within the Yoshiwara. One thing that's particularly fascinating to me is that um, they're often shown being taught how to write and, and how to read. And of course, gaining an education was one of the advantages to Kamaro to entering into uh, the Yoshiwara. Here you see a young Kamaro who's actually mixing ink for the prostitute that she serves who's, uh, who's uh, uh, writing a poem. But uh, mixing ink went hand in hand with learning how to write. And here you see a group of Kamaro that are being trained by the house matron here. Here one of the Kamaro is actually practicing writing. Uh, the youngest Kamaro is learning how to serve tea. Um, education was a very important part of, of, of what the lives of, of, of what the lives of Kamaro were depicted like in, in, in books from the period. Um, uh, quite interesting to find how often you see depictions of Kamaro actually reading books, uh, certainly acquiring a, a degree of literacy and uh, familiarity with the literary classics was very important. Uh, for example, here you see a pair of Kamaro that are playing a, a poem game that, that comes from the Hyakunin Ishu, which is one of the great poetry classics of, 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 of early Japan. And um, uh, the, 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 the prostitute that they serve is reading the Hyakunin Ishu behind them. Um, so certainly they gained a, a familiarity with poetry. Um, in general, uh, some of the most famous prostitutes uh, during the entire Edo period were also quite famous as poets and calligraphers. And that training would have started as a very young girl entering into the brothels. Um, uh, you all, uh, also, they would have been uh, given training in music, uh, particularly in the period before uh, geisha entertainers started to enter into the Yoshiwara. And here you see a young uh, Kamaro attending on, on two uh, prostitutes that are, that are practicing music. Uh, the inscription to this, this is from a book that illustrates different aphorisms, and it's a, a, a lovely inscription that, that adds a little bit of depth to, to the illustration. The inscription uh, can loosely be translated as, um, people who follow the same path feel affection for each other, but people who practice the same skills feel jealousy towards each other. And of course, you see the two, uh, the, 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 the two prostitutes are both learning how to play the shamisen. So there's a, a little bit of a, a deeper implied meaning going on there. Um, uh, they would have been exposed to flower arranging and, and other art forms. This is a flower arrangement for the Tanabata Festival, which is itself a, a festival for literally star-crossed lovers in, the, in the, the, the seventh day of the seventh month. But again, you see a group of high-ranking prostitutes that are admiring the flower arrangement and then a, a young Kamaro that are, that are back behind them. Um, they would have been exposed to the arts, uh, to, to painting and, and, and taught appreciation for painting. Um, and, uh, and often, you actually find images of Kamaro just being young girls. Uh, uh, for example, in this image of a Kamaro who's uh, stopped and been distracted by playing with a dog. Uh, 
Uh, now, this seems like a very simple image, but if you read the aphorism that goes along with it, I actually find this to be one of the most poignant and sort of uh, 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 moving images in, in our entire collection. Uh, the aphorism can be loosely translated as, uh, a dog doesn't forget its home, a swallow flies back to its old nest. Uh, now, when you think about that for a moment, of course, the dog represents the dog from the aphorism, the swallows flying up on the top represent the swallows, and the idea is that everyone remembers their home, everyone remembers their parents, everyone remembers the family that they came from. Remember that Commodore, once they were sold into the Yoshiwara, would, uh, would lose all connections with their families. And in fact, while a dog could go back to its home and a swallow could go back to its nest, a Commodore could not. So I, I, I find that to be a, a, a particularly uh, poignant image of, of, of a Commodore in this particular case. Um, and then finally, Commodore, of course, attended on uh, uh, their, uh, their uh, trainers, the, the prostitutes that trained them, and assisted when they were meeting with clients. Of course, this meant that Commodore, over the course of their training, were exposed to, to any number, indirectly exposed to any number of different sexual situations. Uh, however, in that regard, I, I think it's important to remember that during the Edo period, in general, the idea of privacy that we have today was something that would have been unimaginable during the Edo period. Uh, if you think about traditional Japanese architecture, uh, separate rooms are very rare, separate sleeping quarters are, are very rare. Generally, at the most, you could hope to be separated from your neighbor by a screen. Uh, and uh, the idea of having privacy for sex or any other kind of action uh, was almost unheard of during, during, during the Edo period. Uh, in fact, it's quite common to find children uh, in domestic settings that have nothing to do with the Yoshiwara or prostitution uh, being exposed to, to sexual activity. Now, it is important to remember that these examples that I'm showing you here are all from books that are intentionally parodies, so they are a bit tongue-in-cheek. They shouldn't be taken too literally. Uh, for example, it's really intended to be humorous here, the idea that while a, a couple is teaching their daughter calligraphy, they're catching a quickie behind her, behind her back is uh, uh, something that they shouldn't be understood as, as, as too much of a, a depiction of an actual situation. But it is surprising how commonly sexual acts go on in domestic settings with children around during the Edo period. And that's, again, it's very important to remember that uh, the, the, the whole idea of privacy that we have today is something that would have been entirely alien to, to uh, the, 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 the typical person during the Edo period. Here's just yet a, 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 another example of that. By the way, this went both ways. If you read uh, Time and Screech's book, there's a, a, a very funny image that he talks about at great length where uh, a, a young pubescent son is um, uh, pretending to practice singing while he's learning how to masturbate. And his mother and father open up the screen and catch him. So it, it could go in both directions. Uh, and, um, and, and they complain about the fact that he practices uh, singing far too often for, for their taste. Um, now let's see. With that, I've already gone to uh, a little bit over five o'clock, so I'd probably better stop. But I'd, I'd be happy to stick around for a little bit and, and, and answer any questions that you might have. Don't be shy. We've all been looking at, at, at explicit images for the last hour, so, so feel free to ask any question you like. Uh, yes? Right. Mm. And Let me sit back. Tell me when we get to it. And you said one was not and one was. <coughs> I should be close here. The picture I'm sort of looking at. This one here? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, well, the, the, the idea here was just to show that in the first case, that um, often, uh, most frequently, what you find uh, people performing autoeroticism to are, in fact, non-explicit images. Uh, this type of image is much more common uh, in, 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 in Shunga from the Edo period. It's, it's, in fact, remarkably common. You find it very frequently. But you'll notice that the image that she's using as an aid is not an explicit image at all. And in fact, in that sense, what would have been pornography in her mind, what would have been uh, something that was intended 
to stimulate a, a, an immediate physical response would have been an image that was something like this. Um, uh, uh, the, 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 the idea of, uh, of uh, the naked body did not have the same kind of eroticism uh, for people during the Edo period that it had for, for, for us. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, up until the, the, the 18th century, it was quite common for men and women to bathe together, so, so the, 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 that seeing a member of the opposite sex nude, there wasn't anything that was particularly exceptional or eroticized about that. On the other hand, seeing someone fully dressed in the most sumptuous, expensive clothing uh, could be a highly eroticized image during the Edo period. And that's what I was trying to get across here. Now, with this particular example, I just wanted to offer a counterexample of the fact that you do sometimes see um, acts of autoeroticism being performed to Shunga. However, within the grand scope of all of the Shunga that we've looked at, it, uh, this type of image is, is comparatively rarer than the type of image that, 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 that we looked at just before. Um, I had a question over there somewhere. Yes? I get that question a lot. Um, and I, I'm sorry that I actually let me zip all the way to the end of my presentation here. How do geisha? fit into all of this. Um, there's a, a great deal of confusion between uh, prostitutes or courtesans and geisha uh, in, in the pleasure quarters. Uh, they both were active in the pleasure quarters, but they were two very different jobs. Uh, geisha, and I'm going to zip ahead to an image of a geisha here. If I can find one. Almost there. We're just about to the end here. There we go. Geisha were uh, entertainers, specifically musicians, that were uh, contract laborers that worked in the Oshiwara. Whenever uh, a, a prostitute was meeting with a client after a certain point, uh, in, uh, after around the 1760s, whenever a prostitute was meeting with a client, uh, it was considered, uh, it was really expected for them to provide entertainment while they were meeting with the client. They didn't just go straight into the bedroom and have sex. Typically, they, they, they drank a little bit, they talked, they ate some food, uh, the, the client ate food. The, get, the uh, prostitute was not allowed to eat food in, in, in front of the client. Uh, but, uh, and, and as part of that, they would have musicians that would come and perform for them. Uh, literally, geisha just means entertainer. Um, so the geisha were entertainers that provided music. And the way that you can usually identify a geisha in Japanese woodblock prints is by the fact that she usually has an attendant who's carrying her musical instrument, the shamisen, in a box walking behind her. And you see that in, in, in both of these prints here. Um, now, uh, originally the geisha that worked in the Yoshiwara were entirely men, and uh, uh, one of the reasons for that was that there was some concern that the courtesans didn't want anything distracting from their clients' attention to them and to their affections, so the last thing that they wanted was a pretty woman playing music in the background. Uh, so, uh, so it was generally men. Uh, actually, the use of female geisha first started in some of the unlicensed era, uh, the unlicensed prostate brothels of, of, of Edo, and maybe even before that, and maybe in, in, in Kyoto. And then eventually, after the trend became popular by the, by, for the Yoshiwara in order to keep up and compete, they had to start introducing female geisha into the Yoshiwara as well. Uh, the, there was a, a, an office, a central office in the Yoshiwara that kept all of the shamisen, and whenever a courtesan wanted to employ a, a geisha uh, when she was meeting with a client, she would send her commoner or one of her students to go to that central office and request a geisha to be sent to her, uh, to her meeting with a client. Now, um, geisha were, I think the word contract laborer hits the right tone for their status within the Yoshiwara. Of course, as some geisha were quite attractive, they often started to be celebrated by artists as well, and you can see examples of that here. Um, early on, in fact, they did have problems with uh, female geisha uh, serving as unlicensed prostitutes, and that's one of the reasons why they established that centralized office in order to get control over them and to stop them from doing that. Um, eventually, though, it also does seem to be the case that um, certain geisha held licenses, separate licenses, both to perform music as geisha and also to, uh, to, to serve as prostitutes. But the two jobs would have been separate from each other, and the central figure during the entire uh, Edo period for the Yoshiwara would have been very much the prostitutes, not, not the geisha. However, in the 20th century, as Japan wanted to project a, uh, uh, an image of traditional Japanese culture 
that would represent Japan in the right way to the rest of the modernized world, of course, they, they didn't choose to hold up prostitutes from the Oshiwara as, as that image. Uh, so geisha became a very convenient symbol at that point. And so over the course of, from the end of the 19th century through the 20th century, geisha started to gain I increasing prominence. But the whole idea that you often hear that geisha provided the culturally sophisticated entertainment for clients while prostitutes uh, uh, met their baser needs is, is, is really very much a misrepresentation of what the actual situation was. And in fact, the prostitutes in general were uh, extremely culturally sophisticated. They wrote calligraphy, they wrote poetry, they were trained in the arts. Uh, before in the 1760s, they themselves were highly skilled in music often. Uh, they were very literate and, and very educated. So it's, it's, it's really a, a 20th century misrepresentation of, of the facts. Uh, you had a question? John, you said before that uh, the government uh, either uh, permitted or encouraged certain forms of eroticism, but that when they do something as negative, they suppress it. Well, they tried. They tried. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand how they, what made them decide something was going to be either negative or, or positive. I don't think anybody does, and I don't think anybody did at the time, honestly. It was uh, very random. Uh, uh, I, I don't know as we have any specific documented cases of someone being arrested for producing shunga. Uh, we do have uh, documented cases, for example, Utamaro was uh, involved in uh, uh, an illustration of Hideyoshi. That, uh, and you weren't supposed to depict historical figures, particularly recent historical figures. Uh, so Utamaro's depiction of Hideyoshi ran afoul of the government, and they put him under house arrest for 50 days and put him in handcuffs, which essentially ended his career. That was uh, quite common. Um, uh, I think any of the documented examples that we have tend to be of, of uh, social critiques that are non-sexual non in, in nature, or at least non-explicit in, in nature. But um, it, 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 it certainly was the case that um, uh, sexual imagery was mentioned in these, in these government prescriptions. Um, I think that probably the most important thing to take away from it, though, is the fact that the government had to keep making so many prescriptions over the course of the Edo period means that they weren't very successful in enforcing them. Um, and uh, it, it is sometimes the case that artists would sign their shunga using a pseudonym, uh, which probably means during those points that the government was a little more strict about its enforcement and nobody wanted to get caught with their name actually signed on shunga. However, if you look at Haronobu, for example, Haronobu signed his own name to, to his shunga quite commonly, and a number of other artists did. So it, 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 the, the, the Edo period, the, 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 the restrictions on the arts during the Edo period kind of ebbed and flowed. And it, were, it wasn't uh, ever a restriction that was uh, only against sexually explicit material. It was against any kind of material that could be interpreted as uh, uh, having a negative social influence, which generally meant a critique of the government or uh, 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 a veiled critique of, of, of government figures. Um, so usually Shunga really didn't fall into that category where the government was particularly sensitive uh, uh, about it. I think a lot of Confucian moralists just as a, a, a matter of course, uh, express distaste for, for, for the subject, but uh, they seem to have been a, a, a very, very small minority within uh, the population of Edo as a whole. But yeah, it's, it's, it's remarkable how vague the laws are. I've, I've read some of the, some of the, 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 the edicts, and, um, it, it, and if, if, if you could figure out exactly what they're talking about from any of those edicts, then you'd be a much smarter person than me. It's incredibly vague what, what they what they state. Um, uh, back in the very back. The question was, can you identify someone as being a geisha or a prostitute by uh, looking at the the image and from the hairstyle and the clothing style and whatnot? Uh, in some cases, yes. You can. Um, this particular hairstyle that you see here uh, was called a, a lantern uh, hairstyle, and it's because they, they used whalebone to extend the hair out on either side so that it looked kind of like a paper lantern. Uh, this was a, a hairstyle that was very fashionable amongst all women during the, 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 the 1770s. So you find prostitutes, um, uh, 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 geisha, uh, merchants' daughters, all sorts of women using that hairstyle. 
Um, generally, though, uh, uh, geisha didn't have so many uh, hair combs and such elaborate hairstyles as, as prostitutes did. Uh, the clothing is, 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 uh, uh, is less elaborate, usually, and, and, and the fabrics are less expensive. Uh, but the, the, the key determining factors are, first of all, uh, only licensed courtesans tied their obi, which is the sashes that you see here. Notice how they're tied in the back. Uh, uh, licensed prostitutes tied their obi in the front. And that was generally the most immediate way to identify them, was from the fact that their obi were tied in the front. Um, on the other hand, most other categories of women, including it can get confusing because unlicensed prostitutes, of course, didn't want to advertise the fact that they were unlicensed. So they would often tie their obi in the back. But generally speaking, uh, 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 other types of women all, all tied their obi in the back. The easiest way to identify a geisha is always from uh, whether she has uh, uh, a shamisen with her. And generally, it's a depiction of her going to a, uh, an appointment with an attendant carrying that shamisen. Um, just because a woman is, is shown playing a shamisen does not always indicate that she's a geisha. For example, there's this wonderful, although a bit crude, image by Utamaru. Back here, let me see if I can find it. There we go. Yeah. Uh, in this particular case, it's clearly not just a geisha who's playing the shamisen. It's, it's, it's definitely a, a prostitute who's, who's playing the shamisen. So the, the shamisen in itself is not always a guarantee. But if you see in a context where, for example, uh, a prostitute is entertaining her client and there's a woman in the background playing the, the shamisen, then that's almost always a geisha. And there were um, actually a lot of rules uh, uh, in order, even when they introduced female geisha, I'm sorry, I shouldn't leave it on this image for, for forever while I talk, but um, uh, the, the, there were rules, for example, geisha were not allowed to get within a certain distance of, of the client in order to not distract him from, 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 uh, from his real appointments. And uh, they were not allowed to interact with the, with the client. There were a, a lot of rules to try to create distance between them and the client so that they wouldn't uh, interfere with the, the, the relationship between the client and the prostitute. Um, yes? That's a, that's a very good question. It's not always entirely clear. Uh, one thing that could happen to them, though, is that uh, after they were too old to serve as prostitutes, sometimes they would uh, serve as, as uh, household managers within the brothels. There was a, 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 a category called yarite. Um, and um, let's see. Typically, you see yarite accompanying an entourage in the back, holding an umbrella. Uh, they're often the women that are training the kamaro. Uh, they uh, uh, generally managed all of the household affairs. For, uh, for the prostitutes. Um, sometimes they would uh, negotiate fees and collect money from the clients. Uh, they would do a lot of the business, the ordering of supplies and, and, and things like that. So in, in, in the best cases, if someone stayed in the Yoshiwara, if they were successful, they generally become a, a yarite. Um, now, yarite were generally uh, uh, despised by most clients because of the fact that they were, uh, uh, they were considered to be quite gruff and because of the fact that they were always the ones who were insisting that the clients pay on time and pay the appropriate amount of money and, and, and whatnot. Um, uh, in, in some very rare cases, uh, it was, uh, there are uh, stories of prostitutes whose contracts are bought out by their clients. Uh, particularly, there are some famous stories of prostitutes who, uh, who had very wealthy clients that fell in love with them and bought out their contracts and even married them. Uh, in which case they could really elevate their, their social standing by doing that. However, I think that those stories are so famous because it was so rare that that, that, that happened. Um, uh, in, in the worst cases, uh, once they were essentially forced out of the brothels, then they would continue to serve as unlicensed prostitutes. And in those cases, they generally fell down to the very lowest grades of prostitutes, which were the yuna or the bathhouse women. And um, I think this image pretty much sums up uh, the, the state of a, of a typical, uh, a typical yuna. While uh, for a high-ranking prostitute in the Yoshiwara, you could spend thousands of dollars arranging meetings with her before you'd ever even have a chance to develop a relationship with her, and where she had the right to reject you at any point during that process. Um, for a yuna, I believe the charge was typically about $30. And uh, they were just women who worked in the bathhouses and provided uh, all of the necessary services, including sex.
in the bathhouses. Um, the, the word that's used for these women to describe them typically is jigoku, which means hell. Um, uh, I, I think that the prospect was generally pretty grim for, uh, for, for most of these women. Uh, so that sort of shows you the two extremes of, of the possibilities for, for, for what could happen to them. Uh, yes? Yes, indeed, it was uh, uh, quite a significant problem, uh, particularly syphilis, which was introduced by the Portuguese, uh, was a, 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 a major problem in, in, in the Yoshiwara. Um, there's a, oh, how did that happen? I'm sorry. Let me see if I can find it here. There's a wonderful image of, uh, there was a shrine in, in Tokyo called the Kasamori Shrine, which is uh, 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 one of the derivations for that term uh, literally means uh, to protect against scars or, or, or kasa. And um, uh, people who contracted syphilis or, or, um, or, or other disfiguring diseases would often go to that shrine and pray. Now, as it happened, one of the most famous uh, tea house waitresses, who was a renowned beauty of her time, Osen, who you see right here, worked in a tea house that was right next to the Kasamori shrine. Uh, people would often go, if they contracted syphilis, to that shrine, and they would make offerings to the fox god that was there of uh, little clay uh, balls in, in, in the shape of rice balls, because the, the, the fox god's favorite food is rice. Uh, if they, once they were cured of the disease, if they didn't have scars on their face, then they would come back and offer pure white rice balls to the god. And of course, the pure white rice was a symbol of, of, a, of a clear complexion. Uh, so that's just one anecdotal example of, of, of how we know that there were diseases like syphilis spreading around the Oshuara. But absolutely, it was, a, it was a definitely a problem in um, uh, all of the, 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 the prostitution areas of, of, of Japan during the time. Uh, yes? Since we're talking about health, uh, what happened or how did the prostitutes attempt to prevent pregnancy? It's always a funny thing to me to say that they weren't allowed to become pregnant. Uh, in fact, they weren't allowed to become pregnant, uh, and they practiced uh, uh, they practiced rather primitive forms of contraception, which uh, generally amounted to wadding up a piece of paper and inserting it before the sexual act. Uh, of course, that wasn't always effective, uh, and when they became pregnant, then uh, generally they, they would be given abortions, or if uh, if the pregnancy did come to term, then the child would be taken away. They weren't allowed to keep any any children that were born. Uh, so it was something that, that, that almost certainly happened, but it was always very covered up when it, when it did happen. Yes? Sure. Um, uh, they're, they're, uh, as far as we can tell, let's back up to an image of a wakashu here. As far as we can tell, uh, there weren't any, any wakashu brothels in the Yoshiwara, but there was a separate district. Uh, where there were a number of Wakashu brothels that were all concentrated together near modern Ueno Station. And uh, apparently uh, the, 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 the business of male prostitution is still thriving in that very same district uh, uh, today, but they're now uh, called tea houses instead of brothels. Um, uh, now, Wakashu themselves are a very complex subject because of the fact that they were a gender that was distinct from either adult men or adult women. Um, um, their, their sex organs were male but they weren't uh, considered to be the same gender as, as adult men. Uh, uh, images of Wakashu prostitutes are, are fairly rare. Uh, in fact, this is, uh, uh, I think, maybe the only image of a Wakashu prostitute confirmed that we have in, in our collection. This is, in fact, identified as an advertisement for a Wakashu prostitute. Um, we also have a print by Harunobu that shows two uh, Wakashu prostitutes within a brothel. Uh, they're so highly feminized that the only way that you can tell that they're Wakashu is from the fact that they have uh, tassels hanging from their obi, which only Wakashu had. Uh, 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 women prostitutes didn't have those. Um, but a Wakashu did have sex with uh, both men, in which case they were generally de depicted as the submissive partners. And um, uh, Time and Screech has uh, spent uh, uh, quite a bit of time in his book writing about the fact that they're shown submissive not only by their positions, but by the fact that their genitalia are depicted as, as, as smaller and less developed than the, than the adult males that they're, that they're having sex with. But um, you can turn around and in an illustration from the very same book, you find a wakashu having sex with a woman, 
And in this case, uh, he's shown as the dominant partner, and quite interestingly, his genitalia are significantly larger and, and, and more fully developed. Um, now, Wakashu uh, was a, a, a changing gender category. So when you became uh, 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 19 or 20, uh, you were then considered to be an adult male. And at that point, uh, you were expected to, uh, to stop all relations with other adult men and to only have relations with women going forward. So it's a, it's a, it's a very complex category within, uh, with, within uh, issues of gender during the Edo period. Um, uh, on the other hand, depictions of sex between adult men are exceedingly rare uh, in, in, in Shunga, uh, practically non-existent, except for maybe a few examples of parodies of gods and, and things like that. Um, however, that's not unique to men. Examples of adult women having uh, sex with each other are exceedingly rare in, 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 in Shunga as well. Uh, but during the 18th century, Wakashu are incredibly prominent. Uh, they're, 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 they're just throughout the arts. I remember when we first started to think about doing this exhibition, uh, 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 Stephen said to me, we should do a, a section on gender. And I, I said, well, that's a great idea, but I don't think we have the art to represent it in, in our collection. And uh, he came back to me a week later and I think had 100 images of Wakashu, most of which had been misidentified over the years in, in our collection. But when you start looking, it's really amazing what a prominent social role Wakashu played throughout the, the, the 17th and, and, and up into the, the 18th century. Um, let's see. Now, uh, the issue of gender gets more complex than that. There are, there are a lot of shades of gray. One thing that was particularly fascinating to us as we went through is that um, over time, we started to find images that indicated that because Wakashu were so popular, actually um, women started to dress as Wakashu. And so, for example, when we were going through, flipping through books, we originally identified this as an image of a Wakashu, and we were going to include it in the Wakashu section. But when we went back and took a second look at it, we actually realized that it, it's female genitalia, not male genitalia. So Wakashu had such a social influence during the, the 18th century that in fact a lot of women started to dress as Wakashu as, as well as, as Wakashu themselves. And I think the study of gender in, in the Edo period is still very much in its infancy. It's still really only beginning uh, 10, 15 years ago. No one would have ever considered the idea of there being a third gender in, uh, in, in, in the Edo period. Now that's generally accepted. I think in another 15 or 20 years, we're going to look back and realize that we were very naive to think that there were only just three genders. Uh, I, I, I think that it's actually vastly more complex than, than that, and as we continue to study it, that we'll find that there are a tremendous number of subtleties to the question of gender during the Edo period uh, that, that we haven't even begun to imagine. Uh, yes? Were there eunuchs in the sex industry? <sighs> Not that I know of. That's a good question. I've never considered that question before. Um, I don't know. Stephen, have you heard of any eunuchs? You'd think we've been studying this subject for over a year now, and you would think if Unix played any prominent role at all that we would have come across it uh, by now. And, and all I can say for sure is that we have yet to come across any mentions of it. Uh, yes? Well, I, I, I mentioned the scouts that went out and, 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 and um, in, in some early accounts of the Oshiwara done by foreigners, you actually find them using the word pimp. 
uh, for, for these uh, scouts that went out and found women to, to sell into the brothels. Um, there were, uh, uh, the, the brothels employed a wide, uh, a wide variety of people, uh, but I suppose you know, the closest thing to a pimp would have been the brothel owner himself. And so he certainly had a number of uh, 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 male employees that were responsible for um, uh, you know, sort of making sure that the clients behave themselves. Um, there are a number of, of amusing stories about clients who didn't, uh, because you could easily get into the Oshiwara and wind up spending a whole lot more money than you'd planned by the time uh, all of the tips and things were factored in and by the time you'd started drinking and the charges started to add up. I think it was quite common for a client to wake up the next day and realize that they didn't have nearly enough money to pay. Um, and there were uh, 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 toughs. Uh, there were uh, strong men who would then be sent to follow the client home and follow them around and, and shot obscenities and nasty things at them and embarrass them until they, until they paid up the money. Uh, so there were certainly a, 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 a lot of different uh, male employees in, in, in the pleasure quarters who served a, a number of different functions that would be similar to, to, to modern pimps. We'd probably better draw it to a conclusion at that, but I, I, I hope that you enjoy the exhibition and I hope that you stay for the film this evening. Thank you very much.